Hello, everyone. Um, we are super excited to be here at the DEF CON conference um, because it's actually our first one, I think. Um, and we are here to talk about um, the cloud native project that we both develop and maintain in open source area, and it's called Thanos. Um, so after this, I would like you to know, you know, what, why you need metrics, what Prometheus is, what things it solves, what Thanos is, what problems it solves, and last but not the least, how to use Thanos and what are you know, design decisions that we made uh, while creating the scalable, distributed, um, and durable metric system. Um, but before that, a uh, short introduction. My name is Bartek Plotka. I am an engineer working at the Red Hat OpenShift team, um, OpenShift monitoring team. I love open source, Golang, and yeah, solving pro problems, especially in Go programming language. I'm part of the Prometheus team, and I'm also co-author of the Thanos project. Um, and with me, there is a Lucas. My name is Lucas Edwin Marin. I'm also working on the Red Hat monitoring team and everything OpenShift kind of uh, for the last two or three years. I came from the CoreOS side. And um, yeah, I work on everything that's uh, monitoring, but also I'm really interested in machine learning and uh, distributed systems and networking also. Um, and our job is focused you know, on building um, scalable observability platforms and solutions for OpenShift. However, the major part of our work is also maintaining open source projects, including you know, Prometheus and Thanos uh, on a daily basis. And those projects um, are focused on enabling monitoring uh, via metrics, um, for infrastructure, server-side application, for example, microservices running on Kubernetes. Um, so first, it's important to understand what monitoring is. So let's dive in. Um, I hope I don't need to repeat that, uh, but it's useful to reiterate uh, what's, what are the reasons behind the monitoring, right? And there is a saying that I learned um, kind of the first day of my work as an SRE in my previous role with production cluster. Um, and it goes like this. Running a product without any monitoring is like not running the product at all. It's kind of strict, but what I mean here is that if you want to run something, that means you probably will be accountable for downtime and bugs. This means that you have to have reliable monitoring in order to prove, or at least being kind of aware that something is running or not. Um, there's no point or little point in creating a system that has to run 24 hours per day if you can't prove if it's working, right? So, well, the same message you can read in the SRE book that I really recommend if you want to run things on production. It is a um, SRE book written by Google guys. And there is like this Maslow pyramid for infrastructure need. As you can see, you know, kind of monitoring is the foundation of it, right? It's very essential. It's actually before building the system itself, which is on the, on the top. So um, it's really important. It, it actually gives you a couple of things. It gives you alerting, um, which, um, you know, detection mechanisms. It uh, gives you the ability to debug deeper if needed. It, uh, I mean, you can see long-term characteristics. You can learn from that, allowing, yeah, you can essentially have uh, data-driven decisions, which is amazing. And finally, you can automate things. So you can have, uh, yeah, auto-scaling or um, self-healing based on, on, um, on things that are happening with your system. So monitoring is essential in this sense. Now, as you probably know, there are different signals as well. And this is, yeah, typical way we divide the monitoring. Um, so we have tracing, which is uh, any bit of data or metadata that is um, bound to life cycle of the request, of the transactional request um, in the system. Logging, which is essentially a discrete event. And uh, finally, metrics. So samples over a span of time composed into logical counter, gouge, histogram, um, things that you can aggregate. Now, it's not the end. There are other signals as well. So, you know, for example, continuous profiling, something that actually our team is touching as well. Um, as this name suggests, you, uh, it allows you to continuously collect profiles, uh, application profiles. So for example, for Golang application, you continuously collect uh, Go PProf profiles, heap dumps, threads, whatever, um, Go routine dumps. And this is massive help for the developer because you know, when something is happening, the, um, the application is using too much memory, the CPU spike happens, um, and you got notified, it's actually too late. Like, 
things just happen, so it's too late to profile this application. Um, and with this method, you can actually retroactively look on the profiles that happened um, yeah, a couple of minutes ago to actually find the root cause. So um, this is amazing as well. And that's not the only one. Maybe you know, at some point we'll figure out further um, kind of other signals that will improve overall monitoring capabilities. And you know, how those signals come together, that's interesting as well. This is a like, typical journey um, of anyone that runs something on production and let's say have an incident. First of all, you got an alert, like you got notified, and it's mainly probably triggered by your metric system. Then you go to the Grafana, um, so static dashboards to locate the problem or like what services are um, uh, actually affected. Um, if you want to dig more, then you can always do ad hoc queries, so you know, kind of um, analyze your data that you have based on metrics signal as well. And to be honest, in 90% of the situation, that's totally enough. Yeah, like you already know what's going on, you can apply the fix, you can resolve the incident. But sometimes not, sometimes you need to dig further. So you have um, a log aggregation, right? Number four, um, where you, you can narrow the issue a bit as well. And if that's not enough, you can move to distributed tracing and, and check the latencies for certain operations um, on the way of the request, and that's useful. Uh, and then finally, hopefully, you found the bug and fixed it and deployed it, mm, so you're good. And during this talk, we'll be focusing on metrics, so uh, enabling users to do those um, things like alerting um, and analyzing your data uh, in a quick as possible manner uh, with help of the Prometheus and Thanos. Cool. So in order to be able to make use of metrics in the first place, we have to instrument our code no matter what metric system you're using. If that's Prometheus, oh yeah, so if that's Prometheus or if that's any other service, you always have to instrument your code to actually know what's going on. So you have to say, what are the things that I actually care about inside of my code? You know, inside of my service, what is important to me? What are the things that I actually care about for defining my SLI or like for my SLOs? Like, what are the things that actually matter to my customer and to us as a team to help us debug? So really quickly, let's go through an example application. So let's say that we define some service that we're writing in Golang that's uh, a Golang server that exposes just one single API endpoint at slash API. And it does the most minimal amount of work possible. So 50% of the time, it'll return one status code that's status OK. And the rest of the time, it'll report status teapot, which is also very important. Um, so how would we go and instrument this application? The first thing that we would do is we'd say, OK, let's define some metric that actually matters to us. So in this case, we're defining something called HTTP request total. And we can keep track of you know, what are the total number of requests that we're serving for any single HTTP method, and then also what's the response code that we gave for that endpoint. So in this case, we should expect to see you know, some time series that ends up with uh, labels that are code and method, and those values could be you know, 200, 418, and the methods could be get, post, et cetera, et cetera, right? So now that we've defined a metric, we actually want to instrument our code to use this metric. This is typically pretty easy as well. Um, the only thing we have to do is first you know, define some registry and expose this um, new metric that we defined so that it can be scraped by our metric system. And then whenever we get a request, we increment our counter and say, OK, when I get a request with 200, I'll increment uh, with status 200. And I'll also add a label that is the method on it. And then once our metric system is actually scraping this application, we should expect to see some payload that looks like this, which is time series um, for every pair of, uh, for every label and value pair, so code and method. So here we have code 200, code 418, method gets. And we see, for example, we got 50 requests, 50 get requests that ended in 200s and 53 requests that ended in 418. So that's just an example. And this is how easy it is to do with Prometheus, for example. When you have a more built-out application, you can, get a lot of, um, you can get a lot of different metrics pretty much for free from your client library as well. So for example, if you use the Prometheus Go client library, you can get all of these, um, all of these time series that just kind of qualify how your Go application is running, like how much garbage collection is taking, how many Go routines are working in the background, et cetera, et cetera. And you can define hundreds and hundreds of different time series that are actually useful for you when you're debugging your applications in the first place. Um, but before we go any deeper into instrumentation, let's talk a little bit more about Prometheus in the first place. So like, who here has actually used Prometheus? 
Oh, okay, cool. All of you do. That's awesome. So Prometheus, I'm glad that everyone's using it. We love it as well. One of the things that we love about it is the fact that it's super simple. So let's cover some of the simple concepts that make Prometheus really good in the first place. Prometheus, first of all, is a super simple application, really, really stripped down, right? Where like it's just one single binary that you can run on any machine or on your cluster. And the only thing you have to do is point it at your application and scrape metrics, right? Um, now, the thing that's great about Prometheus is that it's super simple and then it's also really efficient to use, right? So you can either query Prometheus directly um, using Prometheus' own query language, which is PromQL, or you can also define dashboards that are like really complex and can have lots of different useful queries like built into the dashboards. Or you can do things like writing alerting rules and recording rules. So for example, you can get notified when my service is serving too many 500 requests over the course of the last 10 minutes, I can get paged you know, your pager duty or maybe an SMS on my phone. Um, and one of the things that's um, also particularly cool about Prometheus is the fact that it scales pretty well in itself. It can handle tens of millions of time series um, just on one single application if you give it enough resources. Um, and then we're going to be talking a little bit more about how this scales um, going further on. One thing to note about Prometheus is that it's a pool-based model. and this differentiates it from other monitoring systems because it makes it also easier to configure. So this means that um, the only thing I need to get my monitoring system up and running is run my binary and point it at the applications that are actually exposing metrics. My client libraries for this reason can also be really simple. My client libraries don't have to do anything like retries, backoffs, buffering of different metrics. When the client libraries end up taking all this into account, the complexity of the client library can end up being greater than the complexity of the application I'm actually monitoring. And Prometheus, on the other hand, has really simple and stable client libraries that make it super easy to instrument your application. And it also means that um, Prometheus server itself can kind of regulate how much data it's ingesting. And it doesn't have to do anything like throttling or rate limiting clients that are maybe spamming uh, the Prometheus server. And this way, you would like overload your, your metric system. Um, so today, let's see, Prometheus has been you know, an open source project for about six years, and it's super well adopted. Um, and one of the things that's beautiful about this is that there's tons and tons and tons of different open source projects that already expose Prometheus metrics, but it also means that if your open source project, for example, Memcached or something, doesn't expose Prometheus metrics, there's probably some ecosystem um, project that's an exporter that can wrap that component and does expose metrics for, uh, your, for the application that you care about, and it's really easy to write exporters as well. Okay, so we talked about why Prometheus is really great, why it's super cool, it's super easy to run on just one machine. But there's also a lot of times when running just one single Prometheus on one node isn't enough, and we have to scale it out. So let's cover a little bit, like, why would we even need multiple Prometheus instances? We just said that you can handle 10 million time series in one single Prometheus server. It's super easy to configure. So like, why is this ever even an issue? And Let's go back to this example where we have you know, just one single Prometheus that's scraping a bunch of applications. And we said that, um, that this scales pretty well. We can ingest a ton of different time series. But imagine that I'm actually running you know, real life. We all run in, we work in distributed systems. We work in OpenShift every single day. And things break in distributed systems. Really unexpected things happen. Um, let's imagine, for example, that I'm running on an OpenShift cluster or some Kubernetes cluster, and the node that's running Prometheus goes down or dies for any reason, or maybe my Prometheus server also dies for X reason, and it can't scrape my application, and I also can't query Prometheus, and maybe right when this node is down, I'm having an incident, and this is exactly when I need to be querying my Prometheus server to get metrics. Or maybe something that's much more routine, like not a failure or disaster scenario, like maybe I actually just want to do a rolling upgrade of my Prometheus, and I want to switch like from one Prometheus server to another one, and um, I don't want to have any downtime on my Prometheus server. So for this reason, it can be super useful to actually be running two Prometheus servers side by side. And we call this like running highly available pairs of Prometheus, where every Prometheus server scrapes every single application that I'm also running. This way, if one Prometheus server is down, the other one is likely still up. Um, I can also do rolling upgrades. So I can take one down, upgrade it, take the other one down, and upgrade it. And I'll always have high availability for both queries um, and metrics ingestion. So this is just one example for why we might want to run multiple Prometheus. Yep. Maybe one question. If you have two nodes, which one is alerting the or both of them? 
So we will cover that, I think. Yeah, we'll yeah. cover that. But the thing to remember here is that in this highly available scenario, both Promethei are scraping all of the different applications, and they're also evaluating learning rules. Yeah. So cool. But that's not the only reason why you um, essentially have a need to have like more than one Prometheus instance. So let's cover other use cases. So let's see um, our kind of um, uh, example that we uh, we provided before, and you know we expose certain amount of metrics on each of those applications, right? So let's say you know we have four applications, each of those has some uh, number of metrics that it exposes. Within uh, Prometheus, we hold uh, you know almost two k of metrics, and this is this particular query tells you that information, like how many series um, it stores in kind of fresh for fresh metrics in, in something called head block, uh, which is kind of essentially in memory. So, um, and this is kind of number of those series are is called cardinality. So you know, um, and this is super important because cardinality tells you, you know, how um, large the Prometheus instance will be, kind of, so how much resources it will use. Like, this is um, the main thing that um, affects your, yeah, resource cons consumption. Um, so, yeah, let's assume we have this situation. This is fine, like, for 2K of series, my Prometheus will uh, run super smoothly, like, probably, like, almost no resources will be used. Um, and maybe maybe one gigabyte disk is totally enough for that. But like in real world, we have more applications, right? And with this equation, let's say we have one node and just you know 30 apps uh, per node, like maybe Kubernetes node, and each of those has like roughly 300 metrics exposed. Um, suddenly, we have 9k uh, of series in our Prometheus instance, and that's totally fine as well. Like that's super amount, a low amount of uh, metrics. Probably you need to kind of have one gigabyte of memory um, reserved for this Prometheus, um, but that's totally fine as well. Um, however, who runs you know the huge class I mean the cluster with just one node? That's unrealistic, right? So well, let's scale it up. Now um, things get maybe more tricky. We suddenly have like. 3,000 applications uh, to look, collect metrics from. Um, so at the end, Prometheus collects almost one million of series, and that's still manageable. That's totally fine. Like you, you need to have more resources for that, uh, but uh, maybe tens of gigabytes of memory. But that will do um, um, just nice. But then we scale more. We have suddenly 500 number of nodes, which is still doable in in these days uh, for Kubernetes. Um, so it means like. Uh, yeah, 15,000 uh, applications running, and then in our equation, it means like almost five million series. Now, this is gets kind of tricky. You have almost ha hundreds of gigabytes memory right now. The operational aspects are getting uh, you know tricky. You suddenly need to have like more buffy you know VM or um, or like uh, hardware to support this instance. So it gets more pricey and scary, right? And also the disk, like you need to have large SSDs to cover those um, number of series essentially. So, okay, but let's scale up. Like, you know, maybe we have like much, much more nodes or maybe we can change, you know, other number in this equation, maybe more pods per application, maybe, you know, a couple of applications can have like 10,000 uh, metrics exposed. So this goes out of the, you know, out of the, um, kind of limits because we set as a, as a Prometheus team, we are kind of um, setting 10 millions as a threshold for something being um, kind of easy to operate because at this point, the startup of this Prometheus will be slower because we need to replay certain things and, and um, yeah, crash recovery and all of that, all of stuff are super, super tricky. So we really recommend to have like 1 million of series, that's the best. But suddenly, well, we have those apps and we want to collect those metrics. Um, so, you know, how to, what's the solution to reduce the number of series per Prometheus and be able to run maybe smaller VMs, right? So the, the solution is called sharding. And um, this uh, is showing like the functional sharding, which means that you separate your application per, per function or maybe per namespace or maybe per project or maybe per customer. And uh, yeah, you have separate Prometheus scraping those, um, those metrics and being 
we are able to limit uh, the size of each Prometheus uh, majorly. And then there is kind of connected, uh, but if you don't have separate functions or you don't care about like, okay, you don't have information what function is um, uh, for what application, you can use something like consistent hashing, which um, you just tell Prometheus how many Prometheuses there are in, the, in your cluster, and it will automatically hash and um, allocate uh, each application to one uh, Prometheus in a way that it will be equally uh, evenly distributed. So that's a nice feature as well, and you have that out of the box. So this is another way of sharding, right? But what it, what it means, it means essentially that, again, we have another use case for um, uh, running more than one Prometheus server, and that, that's really realistic these days. And there's one more. Well, we run more than one cluster, right? Um, these days, OpenShift or like any other Kubernetes can be, can be started in like minutes. Um, so it's really um, realistic that you know, companies will have many, many uh, Kubernetes clusters or any other clusters running um, around the world, maybe for geolocation reasons, maybe for HGI high availability reasons. So, um, so this means you need to have more than one Prometheus. Well, you could say, okay, but wh why can't I have one Prometheus which uh, collects the data from many clusters? Wait, this is not recommended because like your Prometheus, because of full model, should be in the same failure domain in the same network as, um, as uh, your services that it, it's monitoring. So um, be, remember about that. Like this is very, very important. Um, and, and, and this allows Prometheus to be very reliable and, and, and we can trust it more because uh, we limit the unknowns that are between um, uh, services that are being monitoring and Prometheus. Um, which means, anyway, at, uh, again, like multiple Prometheus instances, at some point you can escape this scenario. Um, Okay, but uh, you know, Prometheus by design uh, works as a distributed, does not work like as a distributed systems. Um, and as Prometheus team, team, we kind of designed this uh, being like this way, to be a single server application, super simple to run, super simple to maintain and understand. And that like simple, um, you know, one uh, binary time series database. But to be honest, it makes the, this project actually super focused on matter, and I love it. That's why you know I love to contribute and maintain to Promete, uh, to Prometheus. That's why it's super popular and um, and one of the best projects with one of the best uh, and kind of friendly community. Um, so this is because it prefers simplicity versus over engineering, and yeah, it allows integrations. However, it is focused as uh, alone into uh, things that matters um, in these projects, right? Um, however, this means that not everything is solved out of the box, and we'll be talking about exactly this um, uh, this uh, point. Um, so yeah, let's through, run through the challenges when having more than one Prometheus, right? First of all, uh, let's say we want to find uh, um, a number of, number of metrics we store in each of those uh, Prometheuses in the current moment, right? So we do this query. Um, and normally we would query, you know, this, um, like some, we will have uh, the number of series in the head, and then we will sum all of those by cluster because we want to know by cluster what's, what's the number um, uh, behind each cluster, um, um, how many series we, uh, we have in each of those clusters, right? Um, however, if we, if we do that, we need to, well, to do so, we need to kind of query each of those Prometheus instances separately because um, it's this data, I mean, kind of database is not uh, replicated in any form. They're not connected in any form. So it's kind of tricky to calculate that. We, we would need to manually um, do so, which is not really convenient, right? Um, so there is no global view. This is um, the first challenge that, uh, that we want to mention, the, the global view. So uh, global aggregation uh, on top of multiple of Prometheus instances. Um, yeah. right. And then it actually gets even a little bit trickier when we start talking about highly available Prometheus pairs. So in the previous example, right, we had functionally sharded Promethei in one cluster, this US1 Kubernetes cluster. And now here we have functionally sharded and highly available Prometheus in our Kubernetes cluster. And it gets even trickier because you see how like one of the Promethei says, yeah, we have uh, 200,000 time series and the other one has zero. Like what's going on? Like how do we reconcile these two differences? Like, why does one Prometheus have so many time series and the other one has none? Um, and actually, why do, like, 
how, like, why did this happen in the first place? And there's, the, reason, the answer is that there's actually some valid reasons why two Promethei in one cluster will have different time series. Um, for example, if we remember the fact that Prometheus scrapes on an interval, right? So it periodically scrapes my applications, like maybe every 15 seconds or 30 seconds. And it's totally valid that maybe in the time span that I was scraping, something happened in my application. Maybe the application got restarted. Um, so one Prometheus will show one set of numbers for time series. The other one will show a different set of numbers. One might show certain metrics that existed when it was scraped the first time. The other one won't show it. Or maybe my Prometheus got restarted and it just doesn't have anything in its CSDB. Um, I like lost something on disk for any for any reason, and it's expected that our highly available Prometheus pairs are going to end up with different numbers of time series. It's simply a fact of the matter. But how do we reconcile it? When I'm querying these different Promethei that are both on the same cluster for the same time series, I can end up with one Prometheus that shows, yeah, I have a bunch of data and I'm missing it in the first time span, and then the other Prometheus is saying, yeah, I have that data, but I'm missing it in the later time span. So. Again, it's, it makes sense that maybe the one Prometheus was down for some reason. The network connection between um, the one node and that application was, uh, was buggy for X reason during that exact scrape interval. But the question is, how can we reconcile these two graphs? Like, it would be great if we could have you know, one graph complement the graph from the, other times, uh, from the other Prometheus. So the question is, how can we make our querying of Promethei highly available? Not just the scraping, but also the querying. Another question that comes into um, that comes to mind when we're running Prometheus at scale is retention of our metrics. So normally when we run Prometheus, we are querying metrics for the last 36 hours. These are the metrics that we typically care the most about because when I'm you know, diagnosing my application, what I care about is like what's happening in my application right now? Like what is the state of this time series exactly right now? Or maybe I'm debugging an incident from yesterday. And it's like, okay, what was happening yesterday at 5 a.m. when we got DDoSed? Or maybe it's what happened 10 minutes ago so that I can evaluate an alerting rule and I get paged or something. So my Prometheus normally is looking at really short time ranges of data. For that reason, typically Prometheus has a time retention for its database of 15 days. And that means that after 15 days, the blocks in this Prometheus time series database just fall out of the database and we eliminate them. This means that it's difficult to look at data from like last year, even though there's some cases where maybe it's really useful to analyze data from last year because I want to look at long-term trends maybe for my application, maybe for um, I want to analyze my SLIs over a long period of time or any other reason. But if I'm keeping all of this data on disk, I suddenly have to increase the amount of disk space that I have available for my Prometheus. And disk space is really the only external dependency of Prometheus. We want to have some persistent disk. But if I'm keeping a year's worth of data, my dependency goes from being disk like this to disk like this. And the problem is that this isn't totally scalable. Like when we scale up the disk sizes, we also have to think about scaling up the operations that we do on these disks. That means like backups, resizes, restores of the backups. And this makes it really difficult to manage um, Prometheus service with a long retention time. The other thing that happens is that when I query for a year's worth of data that's scraped every 15 seconds from Prometheus, that's millions and millions and millions of data points. So like imagine that I query some application every 15 seconds and that means four times a minute, 60 times an hour, 24, days, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. That's 30 million plus time series if I'm querying for some metric over an entire year. And uh, number one, this takes a lot of processing power to compute, but also it takes a ton of network bandwidth just to send all this data from my Prometheus server to the client that's querying it. And what's more is that 30 million data points is way more than I can even render on my screen, right? Like, if I had an 8K monitor, I would need 4,000 monitors side by side to render this in full resolution, which I don't have at home. <laughs> and so what we really want is to have lower resolution data for these really long time ranges, right? So like, for example, can anyone point out the difference between the graph on the right in full resolution and the graph uh, on this side in low resolution? And the answer is no, because they look exactly the same. And when we have really long time ranges of data and we do downsampling correctly, we can still get really valuable insight into this data, and we can preserve the accuracy even while we're losing some resolution. And we can still make the you know, valuable inferences, but we save a ton of processing power, and it also means that we can go from responding to a query in a minute's time to responding to a query for a year's worth of data in under a second. So we want to have some kind of long-term retention and downsampling in Prometheus, but this doesn't exist right now. So 
what have we covered so far about Prometheus? Number one, monitoring is super important. Do monitoring. Number two, it's really easy to do with Prometheus, and you should get started with that. Um, we often have to run more than one Prometheus um, for different reasons, maybe high availability or just because to manage the load. But doing so is pretty difficult, and there's a lot of challenges surrounding that. And also, um, we want to be able to keep maybe long-term um, data, but this is also difficult in Prometheus. Yep, and all those challenges we mentioned uh, with running Prometheus at scale, like global view, lack of global view, um, and you know, handling of high availability, really hard um, story behind like enabling long-term storage of the Prometheus, those did not come out of you know, nowhere. It was a feedback for many, many users of, um, of Prometheus and that wanted metric in this form. And in the same time, um, in my previous place um, at kind of um, improbable startup at London, uh, we suffered those problems as well. So that's why we teamed with uh, Fabian Reynards, who was in the QRS back then, also Prometheus maintainer. And we then together um, kind of created a Thanos project, um, which was essentially fully open source from start uh, because we knew that everyone wanted to solve the same problem, so we want to collaborate um, together on it. Um, and the project has two years now. Um, we joined Cloud Native Computing Foundation, um, I think in summer, and we are quite lucky to have really, really amazing and uh, friendly community that helps us to maintain this project. Uh, and we kind of have that from, from kind of start, so we are super, super lucky. And um, through those years, we managed to build quite diverse maintainers uh, team as well, uh, most of them from different companies, so this is pretty great as well. And you know, there are many users who are um, actually using us right now. Um, the project is free, open source, um, and you know, more users means more chances um, for awesome contributions and feedback, so it's pretty gay. Pretty great, and I think the key value of Thanos on why Thanos is kind of popular is that with single, um, it has single mission to scale Prometheus, nothing more, right? So Thanos is also aimed and focused on, simplic for, on simplicity and, and low maintenance burden like Prometheus is. So um, this is additional kind of um, things that we are focusing on. So why, um, why is that? Well, we try also to reuse as much as possible from Prometheus code. So we literally import um, Prometheus code for you know, query, for, for querying, for um, you know, kind of TSDB for as the, the storage format, and, and many, many other like alerting. So once you know, someone fixes something on Prometheus side, it immediately fixes um, things on Thanos, which is great. We, so we are all together in something called Prometheus ecosystem, we call it. So um, Prometheus and projects around that. Um, and we also team up with the, with the Prometheus. Um, so it's great, it's open source. Um, but let's focus on like how enable Thanos in our case where we have like multiple Prometheus instances, like how to enable that. And we have, actually have some kind of seven steps and I would say pretty simple one, so let's go. Um, how to essentially transform the existing Prometheus setup to solve global view, HA, and long-term storage. Um, so let's say we have like two clusters and you know, three Prometheus is um, uh, overall, and uh, yeah, step number one is to add a sidecar. So Thanos sidecar is a small Go binary that has multiple features, but we'll cover two of those here. Um, first of all, it translates the internal Prometheus remote read API, and that exposes some metrics um, that we selected, select, um, and it transforms that to Thanos gRPC API called store API. Um, and also it has some other, um, it, it has some other features like for example, it reloads the configuration of Prometheus or rules or alerts um, automatically from, uh, pro, uh, for example, from Kubernetes config map or um, stuff like that. So uh, to have Thanos enabled, we need to have the sidecar added to the, from each Prometheus um, instance. And in Kubernetes it's kind of easy. Uh, because we have pods. Now, step number two is to add a stateless Thanos querier um, component, um, which is essentially, it essentially performs a PromQL, um, so native Prometheus query language um, evaluation on the global level instead of just in Prometheus local level, right? And it connects to the store API via gRPC, um, and it actually connects to any store API. It doesn't know if it's sidecar or something else, it just, uh, it's an API. Um, so, and then it can evaluate the query and by fetching the, the data from the nodes, leaves, let's say. Um, 
So actually, it will ask the prompt to use directly. And you know, the same um, kind of uh, the querer exposes the same uh, HTTP API as Prometheus does. So all the Grafana dashboards, every, every tool, all the toolings works uh, because they think it's just Prometheus, but it's something more, right? Um, and it also allows us to answer our previous query, right? Like how many series are per cluster? And, and because it has you know, access to the data from both and it can aggregate in, in this particular example, um, sum, um, all the things from, um, from each of uh, each leaf and pro uh, yeah, provide us with the correct result. Um, cool, now do you remember the kind of the problem with the HA on multiple replicas and how to provide, um, you know, the, the, the output that um, kind of makes sense given um, two replicas um, having some gaps here and there. Well, Querier has built in uh, the duplication layer. Um, and thanks of extra label that you can configure in each of those Prometheus replicas, you, uh, it is able to tell that this data should be the same, and um, there is like a certain penalty algorithm that detects if there is a gap, then uh, fill this, uh, this um, missing um, data from another replica if there is any. So user at the end transparently, um, I mean, the process is transparent to users, so user doesn't uh, know and will not even notice that there are multiple replicas running. It will see like the one signal, um, which is exactly what we need, because now we can, for example, uh, upgrade Prometheus version, right? Uh, and no one will notice finally. So this is um, how we solved high availability as well um, and global view, right? Um, but let's say you want, you know, long-term storage retention, right? Right, so. What then? In order to solve long-term storage, we introduce what is essentially the only dependency, external dependency of Thanos, and this is object storage. So. Um, what we configure pretty much is you essentially give the sidecars in Thanos credentials to your object storage provider. And right now, Thanos supports uh, a ton of different object storage like S3 on AWS, Azure, um, Google, and also some in China like Tencent and coming AliCloud. And um, essentially what happens is that when Prometheus outputs a block in its time series database format, the sidecar takes this block of data and it uploads it up to object storage. Now, one thing that's um, important to note here is that um, this is not you know, some kind of streaming API or something like this, right? We're essentially doing lazy upload of all of our data you know, after two hours when Prometheus actually produces one complete block of data. And although this is not real time, it actually provides other really beneficial characteristics. And the fact is that um, we, can have, we don't need to have a super low latency connection between our object storage and our Prometheus. We can have them in separate regions you know, or totally different places or whatever, and we can just upload this chunk of data when it's ready. Uh, and, uh, and now, in order to actually make use of this data, we introduce a new Thanos component called the Thanos Store Gateway. So the Thanos Store Gateway implements the same gRPC API as the sidecar and the querier. And the thing that's important about the Store Gateway is that it makes, instead of reading the data directly from the Prometheus uh, API, it reads the data that it's serving queries for, it reads the data from object storage. So now whenever I query for data that's very recent, um, my Thanos querier will probably get data from my sidecars and directly from the Prometheus it's running on a cluster. And when it's looking for data that's more long-term for maybe my year's worth of data, it'll get that data from object storage. But there's one caveat to this, and that's that, remember that we were saying that when I look at data from a year ago, I might be getting 30 million time series, and we need some way to solve that. So in order to solve this issue, we introduce one more, com uh, one more component that's called the Thanos Compactor. And this performs a couple really important functions. Number one, it does this, um, this downsampling that we were talking about, right? So I can take really high resolution data that's sampled every 15 seconds and downsample it to maybe every minute or even lower or something like this, like an hour. And I can essentially, uh, when my query is looking for, hey, give me this time series from a year ago, I can give it much fewer samples and make the queries a lot faster. But the other thing that it does that's very important is that it combines multiple Prometheus TSDB blocks into fewer, larger TSDB blocks. So instead of having you know, thousands of TSDB blocks that are only two hours long, I'll have fewer TSDB blocks that are two weeks long. And this is a very important optimization for speeding up our queries because rather than having 
tons of different indices in every single block and a lot of different metadata associated with that, we can essentially um, reduce the size of these indices and combine them all in larger blocks and make, our, and make this way our queries a lot faster. Um, one last component that we're going to introduce in this talk is the Thanos ruler. And the purpose, of this, um, the purpose of this component is to provide a global view of our alerts and our recording rules. So normally, we always advise in Prometheus that you want to keep your alerting, your alerting and your recording rules local to your Prometheus cluster. So that means you want to evaluate the rules on your Prometheus that's running in your cluster. But there are some important places and some cases where you would actually do want to have um, a global view of your alerts. And one good example of this is maybe you have some alerts that aggregate over multiple clusters. Another one is maybe you want to have some alerts that take into account years worth of data or very long-term metrics. In that case, you want to be able to draw, uh, you want to be able to evaluate these queries with data that's in object storage. Or maybe um, you want to do some kind of meta monitoring and you want to know like, is this, you know, this query, uh, is this cluster or is this you know, Prometheus up or down or not? Things like this. Um, so this is kind of an optional component, but one important thing to note is that it actually serves um, these recording rules um, via the same store API that both the sidecar and the store gateway also implement in the querier. So the, there was something that was common in all of these architectures, and it wasn't just Thanos. One thing that was common in all these architectures that's very important is the store API, and we kept saying this word, and like, what is the store API? The store API is a gRPC API that, define, that isn't defined inside of the Thanos project. And this is really, in my opinion, is one of the key innovations and things that the Thanos community actually brings forward to the ecosystem. Um, it's implemented in all of the Thanos components that you know, create, that allow um, evaluation of time series or you know, create time series like the sidecar, the ruler, the store gateway, et cetera. But it's also implemented by some third party projects that want to be able maybe act as a bridge between um, some different format like OpenTSDB and Thanos. So now anybody that implements the store API can integrate with Thanos community. This is what um, the store API looks like. Anybody that implements this um, can integrate with Thanos. I think that we don't have that much time to talk about this, so let's um, get to the more interesting things. Sure. Yeah. Um, one more thing that you can add as a bonus, I would say, and something that actually we are still working, so this is kind of still a uh, work in progress, is um, caching. So, you know, um, all of those things that you query um, and you maybe run some Grafana with some dashboards and, you know, imagine that 20 users are, and there is incidents, so many people want to see exactly what's happening and hitting, you know, the same dashboards, which has probably, um, you know, 20 different um, graphs, so, so 20 different API calls to, to your metric system. So um, caching in this case, and, and all those users are you know, doing exactly the same API, so caching the response for those particular queries are super, super nice to have. And this is where open source is amazing because we have you know, friendly project called uh, kind of Cortex, which uh, is kind of similar, and then we, we are kind of friends with, they, with maintainers from that project as well, and they created something like uh, Cortex, um, like query um, uh, front end, and this allows, this actually works against Prometheus and, and, and Cortex and also against Thanos. It uses some shared caching, for example, memcached or just in memory, and you can put that on top of Thanos, for example, to cache all the responses that uh, are between, you know, uh, are um, uh, evaluated for, for the query, and then, you know, um, those Conse uh, consequent kind of sequ sequent, um, oh well, next quer queries that hits uh, exactly the same data will respond very, very fast without kind of um, resource consumption. So um, this is something that we're still improving. Like for example, it doesn't support on something yet, but um, probably we will make sure like we can collaborate with, with the team to, to make something that, that works uh, nicely for Thanos. But caching is essential at some point. Uh, it allows you to, yeah fasten things up um, um, drastically. And one more thing, one more bonus is streaming. So at some point we were talking about pool model based, so you know, 
for example, um, Prometheus is pulling, collecting metrics from application, a querier is pulling data from the leaves, but at some point you need to have some kind of push method, like you can't escape it in, in certain cases. For example, your cluster is very isolated and you don't allow ingress traffic, you only allow egress traffic, right? So at this point, maybe you want to push the data to some centralized place. So for this um, kind of rare, let's say, cases, we created another component, receiver, which is essentially uh, another store API. Um, um, well, it exposes store API as well, and it allows uh, to integrate with remote read um, in the protocol that Prometheus uses, which um, essentially streams all the samples, which requires, again, low latency maybe network, and there is some delay in, in metrics visible in your centralized clusters, but you know, this is a trade-off um, that you can decide um, on um, why developing, um, uh, you know, why deploying Thanos. And the key part about all of this is that all those components, you know, you can shape this deployment as you want. You can have, you know, just query and sidecars and no object storage at all. Maybe you want to have, um, you know, certain cluster having uh, no object storage, but actually um, kind of data from this cluster will have long-term storage retention, so you have the star, uh, star gateway, for example, or maybe you have just one special cluster that requires um, kind of streaming, uh, so, so pushing the metrics from the cluster instead of pulling, and then you have some receiver somewhere as well just for that purpose. So you can mix things together. You can just use uh, one or three together, so it's very, very flexible. Um, and, and all thanks to the, the, the same API as well um, in, some, in some form. Cool, so kind of instead of live demo, we thought that it would be nice to instead having some nice tutorial, interactive tutorial, to be uh, for you for to, to you know try in offline mode as well, um, so we don't need to like you know prepare something that will go to garbage essentially and um, and actually, uh, there is a nice Katagoda uh, platform that allows that. If you go there, there is actually only one scenario yet, but we are working on other stuff as well. And um, if you click on that scenario, you can essentially play with Thanos because uh, this Katagoda platform allows you to, uh, to run some Kubernetes uh, cluster or Docker uh, from your browser and accesses every, uh, everything access from your browser. You don't need any uh, hardware. It will run on some, on some other kind of cloud provider. And, you can, and there's a tutorial that explains step by step what you should do and, and, and how you can play with it. So we really recommend to, to go for that. And we are trying to make it um, up to date. So you know, it should get the latest version or something. So um, yeah, check it out. And yeah, let's sum up. So overall, let's sum up what we learned. Today we explained what monitoring is, that it's very essential, so please monitor your application, that's for sure. Um, and metrics helps a lot, uh, uh, that's our opinion. Um, we explained the cases where you have, why you can have, why you need more than one Prometheus, why, we explained why that brings some challenges, and, and finally we, uh, yeah, we presented Thanos and, and hopefully explained how in few steps you can gradually transform your setup um, or Prometheus setup into Thanos, right? And there's a very important note, like let's say you don't have monitoring yet and you want to instrument your application. Don't start, start with deploying Thanos, right? That's distributed system which has some complexity, right? Just start with Prometheus. Learn first how to use querying, how to use alerting, how to um, operate it, how, learn from QL first. And then once you hit the scale issues and you are sure, okay, that's not enough, then you can gradually install without, you know, it's not like you are replacing this Prometheus. No, you are building on top of stuff, adding more components and you're gradually installing, installing Thanos. Um, so it's very, very flexible and that, that was our design um, behind Thanos as well. Um, Cool, so that's it from us. You have some links. We are also hiring for a monitoring team at Red Hat. And uh, yeah, thank you for listening to us. I think we have time for questions, so. What object storage does Thanos support? Yeah, we support GCS, S3, AWS, Azure. Um, Tencent. Tencent, Alibaba, AliCloud. We also support Swift. Ceph, yeah. Ceph as well, but like Swift, OpenStack Swift, I think. Yeah. 
Anything that exposes S3 API, yeah. so like Minio, stuff like this? Yeah, exactly. So any S3 compatible buckets as well. Uh, so yeah, but if you are missing any, just, uh, just put GitHub issue on that. And there, yeah, might be more people interested in that. Cool, questions? I, I, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, do you have some user stories how do they run the small components like the gateway they can pack the web where they put these components so it shall be close to the uh data store or how do they run the web? Yeah, good point. Good um oh I read the question. So essentially you're asking is um can we provide any user stories or where you can find the user stories behind the deployment architectures, different deployment architectures? Because you, can, uh, you have many components, I guess, and you, have, uh, um, you can put store gateway in different places together to objects, I mean, with centralized place and maybe in the client cluster or whatever. So the question was like, uh, what's the recommendation, I guess, and like where you can find and read about those? Um, so I would recommend the uh, blog posts and like uh, I think if you go to our Thanos page or like GitHub page, um, there is um, there are some links to, to, to the blog posts which uh, essentially are from different companies and how they use and, and architect uh, the, the, the deployment. And particular question with the store gateway, yes, I think it's really reasonable to have a store gateway in some centralized place in the same region as bucket because uh, the latency might matter uh, here. So that's our recommendation. And uh, yeah, we run Thanos in many places as well on production. We are on call as well, so yeah. yeah. I, would, I would suggest this. Yeah, so the question is, is there any roadmap to open, integrate uh, OpenShift and Thanos, or put Thanos on OpenShift? And the answer is yes, actually, coming in the next release of OpenShift, we're having uh, user workload monitoring. This has Thanos on the cluster. So this is providing functionally sharded Promethei on the cluster, one for cluster monitoring, and then another Prometheus for user workload monitoring. And then you can still have a global view using a Thanos querier. And this means that now you can actually configure, say, I have, a bunch of, I have a bunch of applications that I want to monitor. OpenShift, can you please provide me with a Prometheus to monitor my applications using the Prometheus operator and all of the nice like service monitor CRDs and stuff like this. So you can get that for free and then still use Thanos to have one single place to query for everything. Um, there's, as far as I know, there's no roadmap to deliver Thanos itself like, hey, like OLM or something like this, like some kind of a, you know, operator installed Thanos or anything like this, but um, basic sidecar and like querying functionality, this is coming in a soon release of uh, OpenShift. And actually you have Prometheus operator, right, as well, which deploys out of the box Thanos sidecar and ruler yeah. soon, so yeah, super easy to deploy. But you must integrate the custom monitoring operator, right? Yeah, so that's integrated in the thing, we have to integrate in the cluster monitoring operator and the user workload monitoring, this is integrated in the cluster monitoring operator, but anything, any more advanced features of Thanos, this is not yet on the roadmap. However, you can integrate that on your own as well, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Alex. Yeah, so I think the question is, we are talking about number of series and how they affect the uh, resource consumption, and we are totally discarding the, the number of samples, the retention that we are having the data for. And that's a very valid question. Um, and the answer is that samples and like this, because this, there are two dimensions, like the time and the number of series cardinality, right? And the problem with cardinality is that this dimension is not, not compressible. Um, however, the samples are very compressible. So there are really, really nice methods to compress it. Yes, we chunk it. We have like very special um, gorilla kind of compression format. And uh, it's actually, you know, not a major um, addition to the resources if you add more samples or less, right? At some point, of course, it matters if you, ha if you store, uh, you know, like one day retention or one year retention. However, yeah. But in fact, most of the time when you add more samples, like higher, uh, higher interval um, scraping, 
these resources actually become, these samples become more compressible because they're more similar. And like, because of the encoding of the samples, it actually compresses very well. And the thing that really becomes a limitation oftentimes, or vast majority of the times in Prometheus is not number of samples, but it's number of time series, absolutely. It's true that it has become a limiting factor when we were talking about sending millions of samples over the wire for a long-term query. Like, this can become a limitation for sure. Cool. All right, I think we're done. Please Thank find you. us later. We're happy to talk. Thanks. <laughs>